But I want to take you back in time a little bit. Uh, and the, the first portion of it is the future was birds. And if you think I've got the tense incorrect there, I think you'll understand why in a moment. So in the year 1977, <clears throat> this is when I began birding. It's the same year that Star Wars was released. And I saw this on opening day in Boston, where I lived. So in Massachusetts, if you've been there in the Boston and Cambridge area, I live in Brookline, actually. <clears throat> it's very wonderful in spring and in fall. In summer, it's oppressively hot and humid. And winter, it looks pretty much like this. This is a snowstorm that hit in 1977 that um, basically froze the city for 10 days. <clears throat> All the services were turned off. Uh, somehow the newspapers were able to get through after about a week. And it was on the news, in the newspapers that our school teachers uh, assigned us homework. And most of the homework was having to do with write poetry or write short stories about the snowstorm. So in 1977, I was 14 years old and, and that's what I did. <clears throat> but I also had a strange and unexplicable, inexplained concern for the birds and the animals. I wondered under four feet of snow, which fell in a period of 24 hours, how were all the birds going to find food? And I just didn't know. And I was, for some reason, really worried about them. I guess I had a lot of time on my hands. So I threw out a little bit of bird seed and waited for, to see what would happen. And through my window, I could see several kinds of birds show up and they clearly weren't the same. I found out later what these were, white-throated sparrow and fox sparrow. <clears throat> but it took me a while to figure it out and it took me a while to figure out that they were even different because to me, inexperienced, they look kind of like all little brown birds, but they weren't the same. Since I had a lot of time to look through the windows. I finally decided I need to get a book, especially when a bright red bird showed up and a tannish bird showed up with it. And I had the vague sense that I had seen this bird before somewhere, but I didn't know what it was called. And I didn't know what the tan thing was that was with it. Of course, I recognize this from greeting cards, Christmas cards, and gift wrapping. And out of this concern and this curiosity has, was born a lifetime interest in birds for me. So kind of challenged by those mystery birds in the backyard, I picked up my first field guide for $2. This is the same one that I had. And uh, on page 112 was the bird in my backyard, the bright red northern cardinal. And it explained to me in the text that the tan bird was the female. So that was a big eye opener for me. And I realized also that there's this thing called a range map. So the birds that I was seeing were not the birds that you could see everywhere else. So the birds in California are different from the ones in Massachusetts. <clears throat> and the little book that only had about uh, 200 pages in it, it was quite small, one bird per page. So it didn't really have very many birds. And I picked up, well, actually, I was given a field guide, the first edition Peterson, with a lot of black and white pages. But it helped me understand that there are a lot of other birds besides the ones that were showing up in my backyard. And just a natural thing, a 14-year-old really wanted to see all these birds. They were in the books, of, in the pages of the books, and I wanted to see them. So I set out to find them. And come spring, I found my way to a place I'd heard about. It's right across the street from my mom's office at Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, where she worked. <clears throat> this, of course, if you've been there, you know it. Mount Auburn Cemetery, world famous uh, destination for spring birds, particularly warblers, where it's not uncommon to see 14 species of warblers in a tree during spring migration. So I went there with my binoculars and my book and I looked around and I saw this amazing bright red bird, the scarlet tanager. So it's kind of a natural reaction when a 14 year old sees something like this. It has to be drawn, it has to be recorded. I've got to do something to remember this experience because this was so bright and unbelievably vibrant. I had to do something. So. That's when the flirtation started. Flirtation with birds and with art. So I didn't really have any art supplies whatsoever, but being a 14 year old and having taken lots of standardized tests, I had a good supply of number two pencils. 
So my first drawing that I decided to do was essentially a, a black and white bird, the chestnut back, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> the black cap chickadee, which I'd seen in my backyard. And I knew that uh, I'd seen it in my book as well. So I knew what it was. And I knew that this is an easy bird. I can give this a try. I can draw this with my number two pencil. So I did. A little time after that, I got restless. And having looked at Peterson so much, I thought, maybe I'll do a field guide of just my drawings. So I did. These are water birds of Massachusetts. And you can see the resemblance to Peterson, at least in the way, the kind of stiff way the birds are arranged. But I did acquire a little paint set because I noticed the most, and the, the most wonderful drawings were the ones who were in color. So I did a drawing of um, a great blue heron, my first one, first color drawing and actually painting. And uh, I was really happy with it. I was happy with the color. I was happy with the mixing of the colors. But this is one of the few watercolors I've done because I was telling Daniel, I think earlier that uh, I have a hard time with watercolor. You can't erase it. <clears throat> but I did 40 or 50 of these drawings, these paintings, and um, I did try something which I thought was challenging. I guess it is challenging, iridescent. So this is a common grackle. And you could see I sort of naively attempted to capture the color. There's blue, there's pink, there's purple, there's green. But it, it really wasn't very successful. And I knew that I was having trouble with the, uh, with the paint. <clears throat> but I was determined to be the next Roger Torrey Peterson. So I kept at it for a while. So my parents were particularly supportive, particularly my mom. And on my next birthday, she gave me a wonderful set of books. I don't know, probably some of you have seen these, the Lansdowne books, Eastern Forest One and Two. He has a couple of books on Western forest and Northern forest. He has a uh, monoprint on uh, rails of the world. He's a wonderful artist. And when I looked at his magnificent paintings and illustrations, I was blown away with how realistic they were and how much more dimension they had, how rounded they were, and, and how they, they looked like they were going to float right off the page, which I couldn't say about Peterson, and I couldn't say about the little golden guy, but these were wonderful. So this was kind of the new gold standard for me. But what I found really even more interesting than this was the sketches that were included uh, before each painting. And I thought, this is an artist who really tries to get it right, really practices, really makes mistakes, tries again, reimagines, redraws. And I loved the way this looked. I loved what he was doing, Lansdowne. So that summer, when we went to uh, Cape Cod, as we often did, <clears throat> we stayed at a little cabin that had some great horned owls. And I tried my first sketch of a bird. Now, this was not a practiced drawing. This was something kind of spontaneous that I did in our little cabin. We had owls right outside. And while it may not have looked exactly like this, of course it didn't, and it might not have posed exactly like this, but I gave it a try. I tried to capture something and I tried to keep it loose because I thought that's how the real artists do it. And it's something any art teacher would probably have told me if I had taken a class. But what I found is that after I made that first kind of venture into field sketching, my drawings became a little bit more lively. There was more going on. They were less, they were less predictable poses, something more exciting. And uh, while I was still frustrated with the paint, I enjoyed taking my artwork in a new direction. So, this obvious proposal. I'm kind of treating my relationship with art birds like a love affair. If you haven't caught that already, but there was a proposal at some point. And the proposal was, take a look at this stuff now. What do you think about this? And this uh, is Tunicliff, Charles Tunicliff's wonderful sketchbook of birds. And in these pages, I saw how an even more practiced outdoor artist worked. The number of times he went through observing birds, made sketches in the field, uh, practiced, redrew, 
explored some aspects, abandoned others, made notes to himself about how the final portrait might look. And this was really instructive, not only as somebody who wanted to be an artist, but somebody who wanted to be a better birder. So here's Tunnicliffe working on one of his paintings, probably from some of the practice sketches that he'd done earlier. And there are other artists that I really admire that I came across later, Robert Bateman, of course, who I've actually met. I forgot to say, I've actually met Roger Tory Peterson too, and I told him that he should revise his Western Field Guide. And at the time he told me that uh, he didn't think anybody would be interested, it took too much work. And then a couple of years later, he published the Western edition that was revised. And I'd like to take a little bit of credit for that, but probably not. He probably had it planned all the time. But Robert Bateman's paintings are done in acrylic and they're huge and they're wonderful. And they're really realistic. And he has a wonderful sense of fog and clouds and sky and dimension. This is way more involved than I could ever manage. And I, I won't try to, but it's something that I strive to, uh, strive to learn from. So here's Robert Bateman uh, drawing, sketching in the field and goes some of his practice sketches from the book I just showed you. And there's another artist, Raymond Ching from New Zealand, who <clears throat> does incredibly realistic drawings, really emotional, really evocative. And here's, here's what he looks like. And actually, uh, I can't help but notice the similarity <laughs> in pose between the portrait he chose for the cover of the book and the portrait he chose of himself for the back panel. Anyway, Raymond Shing is a fabulous artist uh, and I really admire him and his field sketches literally done in the field are magnificent. One last artist I wanna mention is Ian Lewington who I just came across a, a few years ago. Uh, he, this is hard to believe, but this is actually a painting on the cover of Rare Birds of, of, uh, of uh, North America. Um, I have a feeling this is an old picture, but the point is that he's in the field and he's working out there watching birds, uh, making sketches in the field, drawing and preparing for a final portrait. <clears throat> and you can see he goes through multiple poses, multiple ex experiments, and uh, his experiments look like the best possible result of anything that I might ever hope to do, but uh, it is wonderful to try to learn from this. And I neglected, I do have one more artist, Lars Johnson, who's done several field guides and he has a keen sense of how to differentiate uh, very similar species, all the leaf warblers from Europe. But he also has a really artistic sense when he's in the field sketching from the wild. And this photograph here was probably more inspiring to me than anything else I just showed you <clears throat> because it shows him as an artist in the field, watching birds carefully, taking notes as he's out there. And to me, this was a, a real proposal. Give this a try, do it yourself. So that's exactly what I did. Fairly recently, kind of, I'm ashamed to say how recently it was, but I did start to actually sketch in the wild at the birds I was looking at. And I, I was intending to be the next Lars Johnson. <clears throat> so the total love affair, from the flirtation to the proposal to the total love affair. My first book, my first sketchbook, uh, I began in December of 2009, not that long ago. I've been drawing and painting and sketching a little bit before that, of course, but I hadn't really done the outdoor field sketch thing. I hadn't really experienced that. So I got a book. I uh, uh, started on page one with my first field sketch. I drew the rough-legged hawk, and I believe this was in Stanislaus County. So Flood and Waverly, it's in Stockton, sorry, outside of Stockton. So uh, in 2009, just after I got the book and started drawing in it, my first sketch of rough-legged hawk. And I tried to record the moments, tried to take a few notes about what I was seeing in the background, what the habitat was like, what the bird, what the markings on the bird were like. But more importantly, the two little flying birds on the right, lower right-hand page, that's what really got my attention. That's where I thought the real value of field sketch was. 
to show that the bird hovers at a high altitude, to show that it adopts a sort of M-shaped profile when it's in flight. So I thought that was the best experience to really learn that. Not only, I probably had heard or read that before, but I hadn't really experienced it. I hadn't taken note of it. And until this moment, it wasn't really burned into my brain. I also looked at uh, it's sort of more field guide style. I tried to document the, the markings on evening grosbeaks because I find it very confusing. They have a, 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 much, a, a bunch of different plumages. It's hard to keep track when you're looking at a flock. In fact, there's one there that has questions in it. I'm not really sure if it's a female or not. But if you see the difference between the bright yellow male and the duller grayish female, you see the challenge that I was noticing because I'm drawing these birds from memory as they fly overhead. Now, here's an example of exactly what I mean. If you look at this diagram for a moment, just study it for a moment, and then I'm gonna take it away and I'm gonna ask you to see if you can identify it among some similar arrangements. So pay attention to where the yellow is, where the black, where the gray, where the white is. Now, if I take it away, now, I wonder how many of you can find that same arrangement in this selection here. Now, I can't see if you're answering or not. It's probably not necessary. Just, to, just make a mental note. Just ask yourself, do I recognize the diagram from the previous slide? And do I see it here? So my guess is that some of you did and some of you didn't. So if you guessed that it was E, you're absolutely correct. And the, those are among you who have a, a really good spatial sense or can able can move things uh, in your uh, mind's eye. You might also have noticed that B and C are in one case a rotation and in the other case a reflection of E. And the reason why this is important is because this is an example of how strong your visual memory can be. And I'm thinking that practicing drawing on a regular basis will help you strengthen your visual memory. Because if you're suddenly uh, tasked with trying to draw a Lawrence's goldfinch or an American goldfinch or a lesser goldfinch for that matter, having the visual memory to remember where the black, the yellow, the gray, the white was, well, that's indispensable. So what I noticed when I started to draw is that this was a difficult task to remember stuff long enough to put my pencil to paper, because you've got to take your eye off of the bird in order to draw. And where was the spot on the head of this harlequin duck? Where was the gray on the back? Was there gray on the back? So what is the shape of that sh on that uh, white patch on the face? Which one is larger, actually? These are all things which seem easy enough when you're looking at the bird, if you don't take your eyes off the bird. But when you have to look at a page to draw it, you realize how our visual memory is not as strong as it could be. And drawing, I think, is a way to strengthen it. So I also noticed of the birds that I was drawing I, they could do more than just profiles. They could adopt really interesting postures, poses, positions. Now the one that's uh, the biggest one in the foreground, yeah, that's lying down, that's kind of a profile. But the two in the upper right, that isn't a straight profile, at least not the one that's facing us, but the one with the tail up, kind of an unusual pose. And I wanted to record that because at some point I'd like to draw that. <clears throat> I really like pelicans because they're so angular and they, there's a lot of motion. They're slow moving, they're lumbering, and they tend, to, they tend to stand around a lot. So they make a really good subject if you wish to draw. I really like how that one on the left is diving. <clears throat> and with this white pelican drawing, there was something that I noticed about this drawing that I hadn't really noticed until I went back and looked at it. But there's, there's a feature here which isn't really shown in most field guides. And it's the fact that the sunlight shines through the secondaries and the tail brilliantly. As the bird flies overhead, the sun passes through its wings. 
that portion of the bird simply glows. So those secondary feathers close to the hip, the tail, they glow brilliant white. The rest of the bird looks somewhat grayish. That's something a field guide won't tell you. And that memory exercise I gave you, the arrangement of black and yellow and white, is just a little bit more complicated than the arrangement of black and gray and white. And in the case of this, these drawings were made after looking at the bird and then taking my eyes away and trying to record what I remember. It's harder than you might think, but it's not impossible. And it's why I think giving drawing a try is worthwhile. It doesn't have to be good, it doesn't have to be art, but I think you'll find that it does strengthen your visual memory. Just a, a group of birds I really enjoy are the herons and egrets because the, the neck is so angular and expressive. <clears throat> and it's through posture uh, and drawing and trying to record it that I really became more aware of how different these similarly colored birds are. The face see be on the left with its kind of horizontal posture and uh, it's kind of stately posture. And then on the right, the hermit thrush with its very uh, kind of furtive, uh, frightened, uh, timid stance, always ready, ready to fly away, eager to hide. And then the way it flicks its wings and bumps its tail. There's a, a very common bird that I love to draw just because I think they're kind of comical. They've got huge feet, of course, the common, the American coot. You'll notice that I didn't draw any eyes, but I think most people understand where they are. It's not the point of a drawing like this. Uh, the eye is not important for this portrait, um, but I, I really enjoyed the American coot. It's fun to watch and pretty easy to get close to. <clears throat> Just another example of something that I noticed when I was doing these field sketches. These ruddy ducks, uh, very familiar, of course. I happened to catch a small group of them uh, doing courtship um, displays on a pond near my home. And what I noticed were these funny horns that come up on the back of a ruddy duck's male. You know, I never really noticed that, and I'm not completely certain that it shows up in, in many field guides. But I noticed it, and I certainly remember it now. The size relationship between birds becomes really apparent to people when they start to draw. Uh, so I drew uh, double crested cormorants next to these white pelicans, and clearly I drew it too large. That was obvious after I drew it, but uh, just something that I will not do next, I will not do again. One of my favorite little uh, sketches was this northern pintail. This drawing is only an inch and a half wide, but somehow, and with very few lines, it seems to capture what I wanted to remember about the uh, northern pintail. Again, cormorants, herons, egrets, that strange uh, posture they take with the neck, really fun. And the scalloping, the scalloping on the back uh, is something you don't see on branch or phalagic cormorants. You see it very strongly on double crested. We have least terns uh, nesting in um, Alameda County. They don't nest in our county, Santa Clara, but we see them every summer. Uh, and they do uh, fish and forage a lot near some of the ponds, just a mile or two from my house. What I liked most about this study here was this little one in the lower right, which shows everything I wanted to communicate about the way the bird dies. And this simple, in simple lines, uh, hopefully I, I captured enough of it that I would be able to remember it and draw it again in a more formal way. Black-footed albatross, again, really angular, very expressive, awfully fun to draw. The big paints, the big drawings were, were fun and informative, but what I really liked was this one right in the middle with this dead straight wing. <clears throat> it really reminded me how it looked when I saw it trailing behind the boat. So the epiphany that I had <clears throat> after all of this field sketching, that when we draw, we learn something. We learn a couple of things, what it is that's hardest to remember. And we also learn what is most difficult to describe. And I think, that's something drawing or the practice of drawing can help us understand and uh, improve. 
So if we draw and bird, the entire brain is engaged in the process of that observation. This is what I mean when I say drawing will make you a better birder. The two halves of your brain are usually kind of represented as analytical and expressive. This has kind of been debunked. It's, it's not nearly as clear cut as that, but you've heard the comparison for sure. And, and you all understand, I think that there are portions of the brain that work expressively and portions that work more analytically. Now, <clears throat> if I bring back this drawing for, a, for this diagram for a moment and ask you to, to think about what we can learn from birding, I would say that the whole brain, uh, it analyzes detail and celebrates color and form. So one side of your brain possibly understands the details, the analytical side, the other side of the brain really relishes color and uh, form. So when you bird and when you draw, and you are a, a drawing birder, a birder who draws, you're really engaging your entire brain in a way that, you know, only, that one, only one of those two will not. So that has resulted in a, a new life together between these two halves of my brain and hopefully some of yours as well. So I kind of invented something. Uh, I take real bird encounters <clears throat> and real memories from birding, of course, for since 1977. But somehow do it without all the wind blowing my paper all over the place. So that's the biggest problem with field sketching. Uh, your little field guide will get wet, the pages will blow, and it's, it's hard to do. And while I really enjoy doing it, I do it much less than I used to. That's probably a bad idea. But I've invented something that helps me a lot maintain practice, continue to practice. And that's something I call the inside field sketch. So I'm gonna tell you how I put together one of my recent drawings and then show you a bunch of examples. <clears throat> so this is an indoor field sketch where uh, my wife Cricket and I had seen um, a Northern goshawk in Mammoth Lakes and we saw it fly right in front of us. And we saw it also perching in a tree because there was a nest nearby which we never did but we did see uh, both an adult, uh, male and female, uh, perched and flying. So I collected a bunch of images from the internet and just put them in a folder. And then I, I uh, viewed all the thumbnails and I could zoom in on one if I wanted to. And I found images that came close enough to my memory um, that I started to draw them. And my first sketches of the goshawk were kind of like this. So we saw these very same poses in the wild, but of course, who wants to take your field guide, your field sketchbook and sketch a goshawk when it's right in front of you? I spent all my time looking at it, admiring it. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it, but I did want to record that experience. So I took all those uh, images, put them together, studied them over and over and over again and started to draw. And when I finally found a pose that I liked, I decided to settle on that one. And this is the first attempt to take something close to our experience and put it in a more finished form. Now, I didn't like it, so I redrew it and making it a little bit tighter, getting it closer to reality by studying more photographs, looking at field guides, trying to figure out why it didn't feel quite right. And I finally, felt that it was working out pretty well. So I started to layer in the details, trying to smudge out certain areas so that it would feel smooth. And when I was done, I did the, had the final portrait and put in a little uh, bit of the context in the back to represent the trees that we saw it flying through. So I also really enjoy looking closely at these drawings. And I think in some way, it, it might be reassuring to people to see how messy some of these drawings are when you get close. They're not perfect drawings, they're not super detailed, but, there's, but they're big. So when I show them on screen, they look great because uh, <laughs> you can't see all this messiness. You can just see the finished product. Here's another example of an inside field sketch. 
Uh, Cricket and I had been to Michigan where we saw several warblers we really wanted to see, including the Cerulean and the Kirtland's warbler. But the bird that really stood out in both of our minds was Blackburnian. We saw them singing, we saw brilliant males, we saw females, so I had to draw it. So I collected a bunch of images from the internet. <clears throat> kind of narrowed it down to the one that I liked most. And I did a quick drawing of it. It just wasn't feeling right. This happens a lot. So I scrapped it, drew it again, tried to make it tighter, trying to make it more expressive, trying to make it feel more real. And I liked this pose, so I kept it. And I continued with it by layering in some base colors, uh, putting in some actual dark blacks, uh, putting in the details, gradually refining it. These drawings take anywhere from, um, oh, I don't know, four hours to 12 hours, depends on how, how ambitious the project is. It's usually done uh, in two evenings. <clears throat> and just to give you a sense of how large these are, this is a big drawing, which is on uh, 17 by 14 paper. And once again, when you zoom in really close, uh, you see how messy it is. And I think that's okay. Uh, don't want to overwork things. There needs to be something kind of uh, rough about it for me to feel good. And there, there is a lot of roughness from this, but it's, it's really fun for me to look at it and see the actual pencil strokes. There's something that I've noticed about a lot of birds that I enjoy drawing. It's the angles and geometry about them. And I'm going to give you an example here of, of not a not a bird, but a bee, the honey honeybee. Um, I've always liked honeybees. I've always really wanted to draw one. And I, a friend of mine had a beehive that he was giving me honey. So I gave him a drawing. So I drew this, uh, careful to look at photographs and diagrams of bees so I could get it right. Uh, started to lay in the color. Uh, it's starting to take shape here. Uh, the finished drawing, I thought, turned out nicely. But there are a number of things here that I had to learn how to do. And remember, I didn't have anybody to tell me how to do this. I just had to kind of practice it and guess. So I practiced and guessed how to make the wings transparent looking and how to make the um, thorax of the bird, or sorry, the abdomen of the uh, bee uh, look shiny. Uh, and then other portions look fuzzy. And the eye, a combination of fuzzy and shiny. So this was a real challenge, but I really enjoyed it. Um, now, my guess is that a lot of you can recognize this bird just by the simple lines I, I put in. And almost every drawing I do starts with simple lines like this. These are, uh, I guess, contour lines or, or uh, motion lines to kind of describe to me or define for me how it's going to stand, where the balance is, how big the drawing is going to be. And then pretty quickly, I can kind of fill it out with the, you know, the conventional circles and ovals and squares to kind of make the body shape and the tail. And you can see, I think I changed the position of the tail a little bit there and the final drawing, <clears throat> Rogue Runner. Now this, blue-footed booby, if you look uh, at the base of the dark throat and you see a thin line that angles down to the right, that's that first line. It goes from the throat to the tail and out the back of the tail. That is the first line that I always draw. Where is the bird pointed? How is it standing? So quickly after that comes the legs, the body, the, head, the angle of the head and the neck. <clears throat> This one is fun for me. This bird was seen um, on Southeast Farallone on a pelagic trip. And um, I do something that a lot of uh, people who draw or paint don't do. And that is, I do the bird first and then I put the background in last. This is probably bad practice, but again, I'm just guessing how this is all done. Uh, one of my favorite drawings is the uh, subject is the great blue heron. I love this bird and um, I really, really enjoy the fierce expression it has. And once again, this is an initial sketch, which I wasn't happy with. So I, I took what I liked about it and redrew it. 
and gradually laid in some color. Those plus signs there are because I traced my own drawing uh, when I was, uh, when I did it again, because I drew it a third time. See, there was too much color, there was too much graphite here. And I knew I couldn't put color into it. So I traced it with a lot, much lighter touch. And then I added some color and ended up with the final drawing. <clears throat> so despite some of those drawings which are complex, I think a lot of times simple is just good. So that means a straight profile is absolutely fine. There's nothing that says you have to go beyond the profile. Peterson made a living making profiles in his book. <clears throat> so started with the initial sketch, a light touch with a pencil, laying in some colors, kind of making sure I've got the colors in the correct place, gradually darkening them, pressing more heavily on the pencil, and then finally finishing the, the drawing, uh, putting in a tiny bit of a branch. And a lot of times <clears throat> you may have noticed if you do draw uh, with colored pencils, I've used a burnisher on, on this drawing to smooth out the colors a little bit. So here's another warbler, an initial sketch. This is black pole warbler. This is a real challenge for me because I, I really love to draw birds that are out of their typical plumage. And this was a fall plumaged black birdian, oh, sorry, black pole. And, um, you know, we don't, I don't see this bird very often. So it's, I, I really wanted to record it, but it's something I don't have a huge amount of experience with. But it was awfully fun to draw, and I was happy with how it turned out. I even have the yellowish feet. Uh, so as far as simple goes, it can also mean uh, austere and, uh, and um, well, I guess, sparse. So this white-faced ibis is something I really enjoy doing. You, you can get a sense of what I had planned. You can see that the legs are cut off because it's in the water, and that the bill is a little bit reflected in the water as well. So this was drawn from um, an experience in Merced. And because there's so much iridescence on this bird, I had to lay those colors in early and then basically cover them all up. So as the bird starts to take form, this is where I left it for a little while. And while it has the deep green and the deep maroon and the deep copper uh, in it, there was something that I wasn't happy with. And what I realized was I hadn't used my eraser to uh, expose some of the color that I had laid down earlier. So I took my eraser and I did basically smudged out some of the darkness that I had put over the bright colors and revealed to, to my pleasure a little bit more of the iridescence that I wanted so much to show. So another, uh, the Crested Caracara showed up in San Mateo County a couple of years, a few years ago. I took my class to go see it. So we went out there and I was so completely happy to have found this Caracara for the class, with the class. And uh, I, I knew right away, I have got to draw this magnificent bird. So uh, I took a pose exactly as we saw it and finished it out. One of the most challenging drawings I've done recently is an all-of-sided flycatcher. Um, this was the initial sketch, which came from uh, a, a first-hand experience and a, a photograph that I took with my cell phone. And um, I knew this was going to be tough because trying to match the color of an all-of-sided flycatcher is difficult. At least it was for me. <clears throat> this drawing used 12 shades of gray and uh, green to get that, get the color. And I'm pretty happy with it. I know it's not perfect, but I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, if you first, if you glance at it for a moment, it might look completely gray, but if you look at it a little bit more closely, you see little bits of green and even slight amounts of bluish gray uh, coming through. And for me, this was really fun because it was uh, challenging uh, it was challenging me to do something I wasn't sure I could, which is to get that color right. Uh, we have so many acorn woodpeckers here on Stanford campus and in the Oak Savannah. We've got so much of them. I, I know you've got them too. Uh, I always love this bird. And 
uh, chose to do one that really highlighted that eye to have little distraction away from the black and white plumage and really spotlight that red. So I, wanted, I chose a simple background, complete white background for it. And uh, I also realized I wanted to have some indication, some suggestion of the, how the, the um, granary looks on a tree. <clears throat> so the most ambitious portraits I've ever done, uh, just because I get restless, I don't like doing just straight profiles. I feel like I can do a lot more. I could do better work and more valuable work if I stay away from straight profiles. So sometimes I go a little bit too far. Sometimes I, I bite off more than I can chew, like this long-billed curlew. This is something I've seen happen a lot in the field, long-billed curlews uh, preening and uh, scratching the back of their head against their rump. It's a wonderful pose, and the bird just contorts itself in a way that it's, it's hard to see exactly what's going on. But I was determined to do it. So I made a sketch. Uh, I redrew the sketch because I, I wanted to make sure I was capturing the geometry of it as well. Uh, I kind of wanted to almost look like uh, a cubist painting here. Uh, but ultimately, I wanted to make something that was more realistic. But I had to understand exactly how those feathers were laying over each other. And that took a lot of time to figure out how this all works. What is it actually doing? What are those feathers that, that are pointing straight up? How does it all fit together? Once I, under, once I felt I understood it, I kept going and I drew it a third or fourth time uh, so I could have a really clean light pencil outline on which I could put a lot of color. So I finally did. And here's the, here's the final drawing of the long-billed curlew. <clears throat> uh, again, one of the more difficult drawings I did was a brown pelican diving. And this is just plain fun for, for me to watch. Living close to the coast, I see these all the time. And Stanislaus, I doubt you get many brown pelicans, but we get them quite regularly here on the bay and of course, right on the coast. And here's my first sketch done from the wild. Of course, took it home, tried to do uh, a little bit more refined job, try to figure out what all those feathers are, <clears throat> what they should be, and why the, why the wing looks so weird, the one that's on the left. <clears throat> I finally got it where I was liking it. And you probably can tell that I'm pressing really hard on the pencil. Um, another artist once told me that I should press harder. Um, and I took that to heart. So now I press quite hard, but only after I'm confident that I've got the color in the right place. So I think the last of the ambitious portraits was this uh, Osprey. And I knew when I put it together that this was not right. The, um, the feet looked too thick, too, too big. The, the legs looked too thick. The fish seemed too large. It was actually facing in the wrong direction too. So well, I guess it's facing the right direction, but it just felt wrong. And what struck me as most awkward was the fact that the, the primary feathers on its left wing were covering part of its face. It, it seemed awkward and weird to me. But I liked much about this drawing but not everything. So I kind of pushed the wing up away from the face. Uh, I, I found a, a more reasonably sized fish and I found a way of bringing in the, the other foot. So it became clearer that it's got a really solid grip on this fish. So when I was happy with this uh, after the second or third attempt, uh, I started to lay in the dark colors, the shadows, the contrast, and finally when it was done, I was quite happy with it. And I thought just for fun, I'm gonna have a few droplets of water hanging off the fish, uh, fish's tail. Occasionally someone gives me um, a portrait that they've taken, a bird that they've taken, and uh, they say, and I, and I say that, that really would make a great drawing. And I show this to you because I know it's not right. I know that I didn't capture the bird accurately, but for some reason it didn't matter to me too much. I was happy with how it turned out. I know the wing is too long. I know that it's, the wings are not at the correct angle. <clears throat> I know that when compared to the photograph, it pales, but I wanted to give it a try. 
I was happy with it. It's a, it's a really difficult pose and it was a challenge for me to figure out how to even get it started. But uh, what I came up with, I was happy with, even though it's far from perfect. So another thing that happens is sometimes my portraits look too vacant. There's not enough telling you where the bird is. Why, why is it just on a white background? And I started to do a little bit more about the background. So I always finish the bird first, laying in the color, of course, as before. <clears throat> and then uh, occasionally I'll do a background like this, which still allows for a lot of white space, but it, it puts the bird in a context, in a place where you can understand a little bit more about why it's standing the way it is. This is a Nelson Sparrow uh, from Alameda County at Arrowhead Marsh. <clears throat> Cricket and I recently saw a pileated woodpecker at Sanborn Park and it was doing exactly this. It was sitting on a branch at a 45 degree angle, pecking away uh, below it uh, on the underside of a branch, exposing a red wood underneath the grayish bark. And this was a lot of fun to draw. And uh, I can almost still hear the bird pecking at it because it sounded like a hammer. <clears throat> uh, a Pacific Wren that uh, I see this pretty regularly. Well, this particular one was in Point Reyes. And I drew this when we were on a little mini break, a weekend, weekend trip. Uh, back at the uh, bed and breakfast. And uh, when I got home to Mountain View, I decided <clears throat> I can't just have it there in a white background. I need to give it a place to stand. So I chose something that reminded me very much of where we saw it. One of the birds I'm most proud of ever seeing was uh, a yellow rail. There's a long story that goes about how Kelly and I found this. Uh, but the, the short version is that it ended up about 18 inches from our toes uh, on the ground right in front of us. But it was so difficult to see because it was so well camouflaged that uh, I took forever to, to see it, even though it was 18 inches away from my foot. Anyway, <clears throat> I really wanted to focus on the bird. I didn't want to have too much context, but I wanted to have something because it just seemed weird on a white background, especially because I'm looking down on it as you could probably hopefully tell from looking at the feet. The context I finally chose was something very simple, just scribbled uh, wild pencil uh, to represent the dried grass that it was walking around in. So yellow rail, um, uh, quite a day for us. One of the challenging things uh, about birds is the amount of iridescence that some of them show. The white-faced ibis is a perfect example. This was my first attempt at iridescence. I didn't know what I did. I didn't know what I was doing then, and I'm still not exactly sure now, but I, I thought this was a good try for my first attempt. What I notice also is that iridescence comes in many colors, and it's usually surrounded by sharp and very dark black. Uh, and also sometimes iridescence approaches pure white to get the real super shininess on a bird. So you could see a little bit of almost pure white in the middle of the wing here. And you can see deep copper, pink, purple, green, emerald, yellow. It's a real challenge and, and very fun. <clears throat> Great tailed grackle. This is kind of a softer iridescence. This is a very rounded iridescence. And you know, I lay in uh, the colors, of course, first, and then, uh, do the blackness around it to basically obscure all the pretty colors that I uh, put in there. And I was pretty happy with this because it doesn't feel like the same kind of iridescence as the white face iris. It feels different somehow, more rounded. And I think that's because there's a little softer transition between the bright color and the black. This is the most recent drawing I did with that featured iridescence. This is a young turkey young male turkey. <clears throat> so again, some of the color goes in first, the bright coppery colors, then a little bit of black uh, basically covers it, obscures it. And when it was done, there's very little of that color left, but there's just enough and in just the right places to really, really feel, to be at least, like iridescence. So of course, iridescence comes into play with hummingbirds. And this Costas hummingbird is a fun example. I saw this uh, in uh, Del Prado Canyon, of course. 
So I try to contradict my own words here because I put black in before I put the color here, but you can see I left a big area for the area for the section that will be bright uh, purple. That color goes in pretty hard, uh, pretty solid, saturated. And then of course, much of it gets taken away. It still feels iridescent to me. Um, the cost of hummingbird is a feisty little bird and I look forward to seeing it every year in Del Parno Canyon. This is a less successful example of iridescence on the wing of a female wood duck, but I, but I like this drawing anyway. I like the pose. I like how she's looking back at us uh, and swimming away. Iridescence, of course, uh, occurs on morning doves. And um, I'm really fond of morning doves. I know they're super common, but I love the subtle uh, powdery colors on the head and breast. And the iridescence of pink and uh, pale yellowish green, it's phenomenal. And a real challenge, a real, a real gift for anybody who likes to draw. <clears throat> so the last kind of example of, of uh, birds that I draw involves owls. <clears throat> so I've been worried and anxious about drawing owls forever uh, because I know how difficult they are. They have binocular vision. And the thing that characterizes an owl when you see it is, of course, the eyes. So if you mess the eyes up, the drawing will not succeed. And uh, so it worries me, it frightens me, and I'm challenged by it, and I'm excited by it. So I love drawing owls, but they are very hard for me, and I'm sure there's a challenge for most people. So this is my first attempt at a spotted owl that we saw in Yuba Pass. Um, there's a long, wonderful story about that, but I'll spare you. So this I drew um, from a combination of uh, quick sketches at the uh, at where the, the place where we were staying, and um, by looking at reference photographs, I just wasn't happy with it. It just wasn't there, so I just decided to scrap it. <clears throat> so I spent the next couple of days really trying to figure out how to make those eyes look real. And I figured if I do nothing better, if I do nothing else besides the eyes, and if I get the eyes, then I'll be happy. So I, I worked and worked very, very slowly, gradually trying to get those eyes so they looked up and slightly to the right, looking up above the horizontal, not looking at me, but looking up and slightly away. As if it's seeing um, something, some bit of prey or some, some predator. When I was done, I had put an enormous amount of work in the face and eyes. Of course, there's the whole rest of the bird. So this is one of the drawings that I'm most proud of, uh, just because it took so much time for me to feel comfortable with it. Um, and I hope you like it too. Another uh, owl experience was more recently. We went to Arcata to um, just do birding during the winter. And Ross Fowler gave me a call because he knew he was coming up there. And he said, you want to see a great gray owl? And I said, yeah. Uh, and then he said, well, I'll pick you up in five minutes. So I picked us up at a little hotel where we were staying. And we drove about five or 10 minutes to the woods near, near the hotel where I was staying. And the great gray owl that we saw there was complete, like most great gray owls, really docile, really tame, didn't seem to notice us at all, continued to forage uh, believe it or not, this is actually one of my cell phone shots. Digiscope, of course. So it's from these, from this experience and from these photos that when we got back to the hotel, of course, we could barely stop vibrating because we were so excited. Um, I made these quick sketches on a little tablet that I always bring with me. And I knew these were not right, but I knew that they captured some aspect of the experience. And the aspect was those eyes, that gaze. I knew I had to get it right. So when we did get home to Mountain View, I decided to really work on this more. So I refined the, uh, the drawing and it still just wasn't right, wasn't quite there. There was something wrong with the head and the, and the neck and it just, the eyes were good, but that's the only thing that was good, I thought. So I put more work into it to make sure I had the head and shape correct. I compared my drawing to the photographs I had taken, and I finally realized that I was, I was feeling much better about it. <clears throat> so this drawing was a, a direct reference to one of my photographs, um, and it's all done in number two pencil. It's not 
There's not anything else except number two cancer. <clears throat> I've drawn pygmy owls a number of times, one of my favorite subjects. I think I've drawn it six or seven times. This is my favorite example. Again, from a firsthand experience, uh, this was at Burley Murray in San Mateo County. I took my class of about 20 people uh, for a hike and a birding, uh, birding day at uh, Burley Murray on the coast. And for no reason, we had uh, a pygmy owl land in a, well, we had a, a bunch of chickadees and nuthatches and other birds, hummingbirds even, buzzing around a section of a tree. And we realized, oh, it's because there's a pygmy owl there. So this pygmy owl was sitting there very patiently, um, uh, just enduring the torture of the other birds. And uh, this was the drawing I made of it. And I was quite happy with the way the branch turned out because there was lichen exactly like this on the branch. But the biggest thing for me with owls is those eyes. I have to get them right or I will not be happy. <clears throat> I guess the last owl is recently, uh, Cricket and I went to Kirkwood uh, in June or July. And uh, the only lifer that I could find up there, the only lifer possible for us to, to find up there would be flammulated owl. So we woke up at three in the morning, got ourselves to the area where they could be found, and uh, we saw it. So we came back after, uh, after the sun came up, took a long nap, and uh, early afternoon, I decided I have to draw that bird. I also had to have a glass of wine. Uh, and that's why, <laughs> that's the wine you see right above the drawing. But my drawing, <clears throat> I was pretty happy with. I was, I was so excited to have seen this phenomenally difficult bird. Uh, I posted it on Facebook with Joe Moreland. If you know Joe, uh, he said my, the feet were too large. Of course, that really took me down. I was feeling proud, but then I suddenly felt kind of embarrassed. Yes, he was right, the feet were too large. When we got home to Mountain View, I decided to work on it more. I switched the direction. Uh, and once again, we saw the bird repeatedly. So it was in both of these positions, but I liked the way it's looking back uh, to the left. Uh, I like that. Uh, and I got pretty far on this drawing, but uh, I realized no, it's, it's not quite there. There was something wrong about it. And I think it's because it looked too plump. It looked like a small drawing of a big owl. And what I really wanted was a big drawing of a small owl. So I uh, built it again, drawing it from scratch, slenderizing the bird, making the long wings uh, more obvious, laying in the colors gradually, uh, applying the details. You could see me working on the eyes, making sure that the eyes have a sharp, sharp edge, uh, laying in colors, blackening the eyes. It's one of the creepiest things about this species. Uh, the eyes almost look dead, uh, if you can imagine. So the final drawing uh, was, it was supposed to be kind of a night shot, which is exactly how we saw it. And uh, we were able to, because we had a flashlight, we were able to see the rusty tones that give the bird its name and able to get a great look at uh, those eyes that shape and the posture the bird adopts just before it flies off again. So. All of this kind of makes me think that I have one major goal. Uh, having done all this drawing, I improved my own technique a bit. Um, I've done a, a, a few styles. I've taken on a few challenges from uh, ambitious portraits to very realistic, photorealistic drawings. Uh, and um, what I've decided is I want to encourage other people to draw. So if you consider where we all start, uh, we all start pretty um, humbly. And my first drawings were pretty awful, uh, but they did, they did have some potential to improve. And I think that's what it's all about. So I'd like to encourage folks to take a stab at drawing. And I, I like this drawing here because this cartoon here, because it basically pokes fun at uh, instructive manuals or draw, how to draw books. You know, first draw a couple of circles and then, then draw the rest of the owl. Of course, that's not how easy it is. You've seen, uh, you've heard me tell how long some of these portraits take and how many mistakes I make and how many times I restart a drawing. But I suggest that at some point in the near future, you all grab a number two pencil and make sure you get the ones that have the erasers because believe me, uh, they come in useful. And 
find a simple bird to test your memory with. So in this case, I've obviously got the common golden eye. Uh, it's got some challenging details, but really it's a fairly simple bird with only black and white to work with, to deal with, to worry about. <clears throat> so you could close the book and draw, um, or you could draw with the book open. It's entirely up to you. But take a stab at this. Find a, find a bird with a simple color pattern, stare at it for a couple of moments, and then try to draw it, either by memory or while you're looking at the book. <clears throat> and when you're ready, uh, when, you cut, when you get to this point, you've got something that resembles the bird, uh, try a little bit of color. And you'll find that you're not gonna use the bright blues, like purples, pinks, et cetera, bright reds very often. If you try something with iridescence, especially with the golden eye, you might be using some of that deep, wonderful green. Um, but you're gonna use most often uh, the grays, the blacks, the tans uh, for any portraits of birds. A little bit of the green, greenish gray, olive, those will come in handy. But the brilliant colors, probably less so. I have them, but I use them much less often. If you're curious about the kind of paper I use, the kind of pencils I like, uh, I use the Robert Bateman uh, recycled stock. I, I usually use the, 11, the uh, 17 by 14 or 18 by 14 size. It's a big sheet, but uh, you could also use a small book. It really doesn't matter. You could use scratch paper, something without lines, of course. The, uh, my favorite pencils are Faber-Castell. Um, they're really beautiful. They're very slightly waxy, nice build up but not too much so. And then Prismacolor, a little bit less expensive, but very good. And good color, good color palettes available. A lot of earth tones, a lot of uh, neutral colors that you'll find useful. So my guess is that after you give this a try, and I hope that you do, that you'll find your birding change. Um, you'll find that your memory improves, I'm hoping. And your attention to detail will become sharper. And uh, you'll want to draw more. And that's really, that's really the most important thing. Uh, this should not be torture. Uh, I'm, I hope they, I'm not encouraging you to do something that you'll dislike. I'm hoping that you will like it. I think you will. So there are a couple of books that I strongly recommend. Jack Law's book on drawing birds. He's a personal friend. Uh, and many of the techniques that I've shown you come, are, are described in his book, particularly iridescent. So a wonderful book. And here's a book by Tim Wooten, Drawing and Painting Birds. The book, this book has real value in that it shows you the various ways uh, that different artists uh, express their subject. That so we have highly realistic, highly uh, expressive, highly uh, imp impressionist, and even geometric representations of birds. So there isn't any one style that you have to use. But the point is that drawing at all should improve your memory and, and help you uh, learn how to describe what you're seeing because you have to describe it to your pencil when you're putting it on paper. So if you're curious about my blog that Sal mentioned at the beginning, you can find it here, neornithes.wordpress.com. And I put a lot of drawings there like you've seen tonight that go from beginning to end. Sometimes I get lazy and I put the finished drawing in without the without the preliminary stuff. I try not to do that, but sometimes it happens. <clears throat> and with that, I'll just say thank you because I really enjoyed talking to you about this, and I, I hope that was uh, I hope that was helpful.